Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. We've been called by a holy God to holiness. That's our holy calling. If you and I profess to live a Christian life, then we mustn't continue the life before Christ. We need to find our identity in our sainthood by faith in Jesus Christ. Holiness is not just a creed or a catchword. You may even be surprised to know that it's not even a virtue or behavior as we may often think. Instead, holiness is about a state of being more than it is about doing. Today on Know the Truth, we'll learn what it means to be holy and how we can live a life of holiness through God's Spirit. Now let's join Philip DeCourcy in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 through 8 for his message titled, Make a Clean Break, Part 1 from his Take the Call series. Holiness of life is the ambition of every Christian man, or it should be. Our number one desire as men is to cast a long and godly shadow wherever we go. Our prayer is that as people encounter us, they will perceive us as holy men of God, because encountering us, they encounter Christ in us. And with that in mind, I want us to turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 through 8. Because here we have a specific call to holiness. Now, in the textual context of 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 to 8, and in the cultural context, holiness in this passage is defined as sexual purity. Okay? Holiness will show up in a whole lot of areas. And one of the areas holiness will show up in is the fact that you and I have determined that the will of God for us, our sanctification, verse 3, our holiness is that we should abstain, avoid, make a clean break from sexual immorality. That's not easy given our culture. That wasn't easy for them given their culture. But who said the Christian life was going to be easy? I thought it was a cross, right, you had to take up? Not a chair, easy chair you sit in. So let's come to this. I need to hear this. You need to hear that. I speak as a man to man. We need to hear this passage, and we need to expound it and learn it. And so as we come to it, let me just put it in its context quickly, and we'll just cover one big point this morning as time allows. But the text is moving from the personal to the pastoral from the biographical to the ethical. That's what we have in verse 1. Finally, then, brethren. Or basically, this is the rest of what I want to say. Or the main argument is over. Now, here's what I want to say in terms of what, what remains. Finally, then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us, how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we give you through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the will of God. Abstain from sexual immorality. We're moving from the personal to the pastoral. And Paul is concerned that they make a clean break from their prior passion of lust, which marks the Gentile world out of which they came. Right? He wants them to separate from the sex-soaked culture that surrounds them. He wants them to run from it. He wants them to run from what they once ran after. Okay? To varying degrees, every man in this room at one point in their life apart from Christ has run after lust. Now we're being told to run from it. We're not being told to deny our sexual passions or to deny our sexual drive. That's a God-given gift to be expressed in a beautiful way with a woman you love in the covenant of marriage and let her breasts satisfy you. The Bible's not embarrassed to speak about sex morality or cleanness, but we're to flee from the substitute. We're to flee from the sinful. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee sexual immorality. And remember, Paul's writing 1 Thessalonians from Corinth. 
writing 1 Thessalonians from Corinth, you ever read about Corinth, the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of sex and beauty? The temple, we believe, was serviced by a thousand prostitutes. Corinth was a seaport town with sailors, and there was a red light district and an entertainment district where you could go and in passion of lust have all you want as a Gentile. Thessalonica, not much better. Seaport town also, from what we can tell, there were pagan temples that had sexual acts as part of the, the supposed worship experience. Innkeepers and shopkeepers kept slave girls to provide sexual entertainment for the customer. In fact, F.F. F. Bruce, the great New Testament scholar, spoke of the general Roman culture. A man might have a mistress who could provide him also with intellectual companionship. The institution of slavery made it easy for him to have a concubine with casual gratification at the ready. Harlots were available, and the function of his wife was to manage his house and to mother his legitimate children. That's the culture. That's the background. When you read this verse now, we need you to abstain from sexual immorality. It was real, and it's real to us, isn't it? Our culture is reverting back. Think about this. This is staggering, sad, heartbreaking. The United States and the Western world is reverting back behind Christianity. That's where we're going as a culture. We're getting behind Christianity, right? Christianity spread. The Judeo-Christian philosophy of life influenced law and behavior and acted as a restraint in our societies. You look at the news, you watch the television, you listen to liberal politicians, and you realize they have an agenda to take us back behind Christianity to a society not unlike that of the Romans. Biology is being denied. The obvious is being denied. If you had some horse sense, you would know that a boy's a boy and a girl's a girl. Marriage is being redefined. Porn is now being promoted as something healthy. You can go to marriage counseling anywhere in this country, and some psychologist or counselor will tell a marriage that's flat, maybe you should watch pornography together and find the spark. Sex is simply a desire to be satisfied, much like eating. That's the message of MTV, HBO. John MacArthur put it as well as anybody. He kind of takes us from the 60s, where you have free love and the introduction of contraception, into the 2000s here with the redefinition of biology, where parents are telling us, Hollywood stars boasting about the fact that they haven't told their little boy what he is. They'll let their little boy decide at age five or six whether he's a girl or not. We have a stupid president who said that on live television to a mother that, you know what, why don't you just let your eight-year-old decide what sex they are? Crazy. Nuts. Dangerous. And we're to separate ourselves from it. And as John MacArthur said, we have moved from sex with thy children to sexless children. Scary. There's a lot in that little statement. It's about 40 years of history down into a sentence from childless sex to sexless children. All right. Wow. Here's the first thought. <laughs> After many, many thoughts. If I was to break this passage down, we've got three things, and we'll cover this one here in about 10 or or so minutes, so hang in. What I call the pleasure of holiness. Think about that. That's a word you wouldn't necessarily associate with holiness, right? You'd associate words like restraint, repentance, giving up something, staying away from something. It's true. We'll get there. But there's actually a pleasure to holiness, So let's look at the pleasure to holiness. That's verses 1 and 2. And then next month, please come back and bring other men. We'll get into the heart of some of this, the purity of holiness, and then the power of holiness. Okay, the purity of holiness, abstain from sexual immorality. The power of holiness is God has given us His Holy Spirit. You don't have to fight this battle by yourself. You've got a comforter. You've got a paraclete that comes alongside you to strengthen you in the battle. But let's jump quickly into the pleasure of holiness, verses 1 to 2. And here's the point, guys. The first thing I want you to notice, and this is where we're really going to stop this morning, 
Notice that holiness is not primarily a matter of cold obedience to a set of rules, okay? It would be easy for us to read this text, the void from sexual immorality, turn the, the TV off, don't go to that website, you know, stop it. Just a cold, stop it. And there's some merit to that. I would say to you and to me in any situation, like, stop it. But holiness is not simply or primarily a matter of cold obedience to a set of rules. It is first and foremost the outworking and the overflow of love for God and a desire to please Him. Now, while verses 1 and 2 is kind of a door into the rest of the book, immediately we're dealing with sexual immorality, right, in verse 3. But this call to acknowledge the will of God and turn from sexual immorality, it's prefaced and predicated upon what? Walk with God and please Him. So the avoidance of sexual immorality is tied to pleasing God. So it is not primarily the outcome of cold obedience to a set of rules. Holiness of life and sexual purity is the outcome of our love for God and a desire on our part never to displease Him. Why would you displease Him? Why would I, given the beauty of His character, the loveliness of His Son, the grace and mercy that He has given us? How lovely, says the psalmist in Psalm 84, is your dwelling place, O God. My soul cries out for you, the living God. God's lovely, and His house is lovely, and His law is lovely, and His Son is lovely. And I want to please Him because He's lovely, and I love Him, and you love Him. And I want to make sure my fight with sexual immorality starts there and stays there in that sense. It's another joy. It's not a chore to walk in a manner pleasing to God. His will is good and pleasing, isn't it? Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. And therefore, when I'm told here to fulfill the will of God, which is to turn from sexual immorality, that's a good thing. That's a pleasing thing. That's not God trying to rob me. That's God trying to protect me. That's God trying to bring joy to my life. Because true joy is found in my relationship with Him unspoiled. Revelation 4.11, we were created by His will and for His pleasure. Think about that. Revelation 4.11 in the New Living Translation, created by His will and for His pleasure. Pleasing God is my purpose in life. It's my burning ambition. It should be yours. It's our motive behind everything, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9, Paul says, I always do those things that please him. Hmm. Think about that. That was the wellspring of Christ's own obedience. During his earthly life and ministry, God's love for us is predicated upon Christ's love for the Father. You see, that's why he was willing to die on a cross. He did it for the Father first. He always did those things that Please, the Father. Jesus didn't die, guys, that God might love us. That's heretical. Jesus died because God loved us. And Jesus died because he loved the Father who loved us. That's why he always did the things that pleased him, because he loved the Father. And the Father loved him. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is the pleasure of holiness. I want my sexual purity to be predicated upon the fact I always want to do those things that please Him. I don't want it to be just cold obedience, so that's part of it. Sometimes that just may be it until I can get to a better place where I just, you know, run out of fear or, you know, run out of conformity. But I want it to be deeper than that. I want it to be more real than that. I want it simply to be, I love Him. I won't do this. I won't betray Him. I I won't spoil His grace and mercy and kindness to me. We need to hear that. We need to live lives, guys, that's pleasing to God. In the context, as John Stott brings out, that pleasure will show up in sexual purity. It'll show up in hard, honest work, verse 11, and it'll show up in how you handle grief. That's the immediate context. Sex, work, and death. And if you want to walk worthy of the Lord, then live a pure life sexually. 
Live a quiet and peaceable life. Mind your own business and work with your hands. And don't grieve as those who have no hope. David Brainard, the great missionary and lover of Jesus Christ, died at 29 in the prime of life, ravaged by tuberculosis. He said this to those that gathered around his deathbed, my heaven is to please God and to glorify Him and give all to Him and to be wholly devoted to His glory. That is the heaven I long for. That is my religion. That is my happiness. I do not go to heaven to be advanced, but to give honor to God. All my desire is to glorify God. I see nothing else in the world that can yield any satisfaction besides living to God, pleasing Him, and doing His whole will. It's okay. In a few minutes, here's where I'm going to take this, and this is helpful. In fact, while we're not getting into the heart of how we tackle sexual immorality till next month, this is actually the beginning of your kind of defense posture. Or this is how I want you to attack the temptation of sexual immorality. This is where it begins. You must have a God-centered morality. You must have a God-centered morality that expresses itself in joyful obedience. This is what we're dealing with here, with the pleasure of holiness. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please Him. For you know what commandments we give you. You know what the will of God is. Turn from sexual immorality. Did you notice? Hang in for a few minutes. Did you notice the argument here isn't the fear of consequences of sexual sin? There's a place for that. But I think that's overdone, especially with our young people. Okay? The fear of detection, the fear of infection, whatever it is. The argument here isn't fear the consequences of sexual sin. The argument is here, fear God. Walk in a way that pleases Him. Does He not capture your imagination and affection given who He is through Jesus Christ? Did you notice the argument here isn't sex is worth waiting for? And some of you have gone to conferences where that's the theme, and I love it. It is worth waiting for. Solomon would tell us, don't awaken love too early. But that's not Paul's focus. The argument here isn't that sex is worth waiting for. The argument here is God is worthy of your obedience. Walk in a manner pleasing to Him. The argument here is not pleasure is bad because pleasure isn't bad. The argument here isn't pleasure is bad. The argument is God is the greatest pleasure. He made you for His glory. True satisfaction is found in a relationship with Him. So here's Paul's answer to the issue of sexual passion. Delight in the Lord. Okay, delight in the Lord. Psalm 37, verses 3 to 5, delight yourself in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. The pleasure of sexual sin is to be fought, not by prohibition alone, that is, stop it or don't do it, or thou shalt not. The pleasure of sexual sin is to be fought, not by prohibition alone, but through the greater pleasure of knowing and pleasing God. The key to holiness This is where we're starting this big argument and stopping our sermon. The key to holiness is falling in love with the Lord and Jesus Christ. We're going to get to this next time, okay? Watch what you watch. Watch your interaction with the opposite sex. Love your wife passionately. We can go down a whole list of things. But the argument in 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 1 to 2 begins with fall in love with God. You remember what we told you, says Paul? Walk and please him. And that's not cold. Isn't he pleasing? Isn't he lovely? Isn't his grace marvelous? Isn't his mercy undeserved? Our sexuality is a gift from God. A good gift from the giver of all good and perfect gifts. But we must never allow the gift, which is sex in its right place, We must never allow the gift to be greater of weight and worth than the giver of the gift. Nothing made by God should be bigger to us than God himself. To allow our sexuality and the fulfillment of our sexual drives to dominate our lives like the Gentiles do who know not God is an act of adultery. 
Let me say that again. To allow our sexuality and the fulfillment of it to dominate our lives at the expense of God's glory is an act of immorality and idolatry. Elizabeth Elliot said this, when obedience to God contradicts what I think will give me pleasure, let me ask myself if I love Him. When obedience to God contradicts what I think will give me pleasure, let me ask myself if I love Him. I got this thought as we close from Psalm Storms in his book, Pleasures Forevermore. Here's what he says, I'll tell you, how do we fight the pleasure of sin? With another pleasure. Holiness is not attained, at least not in any lasting, life-changing manner, merely through prohibitions, threats, fear, shame-based appeals. Holiness is attained by believing in, trusting, banking on, resting in, savoring, and cherishing God's promise of a superior happiness that comes only by falling in love with Jesus. The power that the pleasures of sin exert on the human soul will ultimately be overcome only by a superior power of the pleasures of knowing and being known, loving and being loved by God in Christ. Or again, the only way to conquer one pleasure is with another superior, more pleasing pleasure. Guys, C.S. Lewis would say to us when we're on the verge of sexual sin, you are far too easily pleased. You're far too easily pleased. Father, we thank you for these men, this hallowed hour together. It's hard not to go through a day and not be challenged sexually in this society. Lord, we're tired at times. The fight seems long and unwinnable at times. But may we pursue what we're being taught here by Paul. And may victory begin in falling in love with the Lord Jesus Christ in all his beauty and holiness. He lived sexually pure in dependence upon the Holy Spirit and driven by this thought, I'd always do those things that please the Father. For we ask and pray it all in Jesus' name, ever so humbly. Amen. Yes, amen. You're listening to Know the Truth, and that was Pastor Philip DeCourcy with his message titled Make a Clean Break, Part 1. Remember, if you missed any of this message, you can find it online at ktt.org or on the KTT app or podcast. Living a holy life isn't easy. In fact, it's impossible to do on our own. But aren't you glad we have the help of the Holy Spirit and a Savior who intercedes on our behalf? And just as Christ intercedes for us, He also uses us, the church, to intercede on behalf of others. That's why at Know the Truth, we share God's Word with listeners everywhere, so that they too can experience God as their helper. And we wouldn't be able to do this without individuals like you who contribute to our ministry. So will you stand with us today? You can make a special one-time donation at ktt.org. Or give to Know the Truth when you call 888-644-8811. And as a thank you, you'll receive a wonderful book by Derek Tidball titled, Called by God, Exploring Our Identity in Christ, where he addresses the different stages of a Christian's walk, starting with our conversion and concluding with our promotion to glory. Be sure to request this timely book when you give today. Again, call 888-644-8811 or sign up online at ktt.org. Well, I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd, inviting you to join us tomorrow for another message on God's call to holiness. That's next time on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Mm